Good afternoon. Uh, this is Kibble Equipment's second virtual planner clinic. Uh, today is Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. Today we are going to cover uh, getting started with a 2630 and Seedstar XP. Uh, last, uh, a few weeks ago on March 11th, we did the same type of topics but with a Generation 4 and we had a lot of good feedback from people that they like to see a version of this with a 2630. Uh, so, uh, we have some live comments here, uh, so if you have any questions, please chime in. But other than that, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Chris Horb. I'm part of the technology support team here at Kibble Equipment, and I'm coming to you live from Owatonna, Minnesota. Joining me, Margo, could you do a sound check and introduce yourself? You bet. Test, test. Can you hear me, Chris? Yes, absolutely. All righty. Um, yeah, my name is Margo Sheik, and I am located in Tyler, Minnesota today. And um, I work with Chris on the Precision Ag team, and I travel around uh, most of the stores in South Dakota and also in Wheaton, Minnesota. So I hang out here on the west side. So perfect. And how long have you been with Kibble? Um, I've been with Kibble since uh, 2014. So gee, I had a seven-year anniversary here. It looks like, and uh, yeah, been in the John Deere business for I hate to say it, but 20 some years now. Yeah, and I've uh, been with Kibble just about two years, and the same as Margo, been in the John Deere world for about the same amount of time. So yeah, so we'll get to it. Um, to start, the way we're going to flow this is similar to last year. We're going to start with going through some ready-to-plant to guides. I know it's kind of soggy out there, uh, but if you haven't started thinking about getting your planter hooked up, uh, please do so. Again, some magical things happen to those planters in the sheds that if they worked last year and you pull them out and everything seems to be the same, um, just some gremlins happen and, and things don't work properly. Um, so we're going to start by going through our ready to plant guides and then we're going to switch over to uh, the, the simulator uh, to show the display and how, how things work. Uh, so these guides, they're available on kibbleeq.com. Uh, if you go to service and just click on service and then on the left hand side there's planter guides and then Margo is going to start with the Seedstar 2 XP version. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Margo. I'll ch chime in here if we get some comments or questions, okay? Sounds great. Um, so just want to double check that we're looking at my screen and we see a hydraulic hookup page. Is that good? Yep, it looks, looks fabulous. Perfect. Okay, so um, we're going to kind of start up just like we were... Uh, you know, first things first, I got to look at this mess of hoses and cords uh, at the back of my planter hitch, right? And I got to hook it up to the back of my tractor. Um, so this screen here is from our guide that Chris mentioned. And um, this is a pretty traditional setup. Now, not every planter is plumbed the same, but um, I would refer to this guide or your John Deere shop, whichever uh, kibble location you're working with, get a hold of them and they can always help you through this as well. Um, but we plumb, um, I'll kind of start here by taking a look to follow my little handprint here. Um, we're going to plumb our raised lower circuit to the number one SCV, which is the bottom, uh, valve in our valve stack and, uh, raised fold will go through there. Um, maybe I should back up one step. We always say, look, it even says case drain first. So there'll be a flat flush face coupler that is responsible for case drain off of all the hydraulic uh, motors in your system. So CCS fans, vacuum fans, those sort of things. They're all tied together into this line. This is for you know protection purposes. If we shut off a uh, uh, hydraulic control quickly or we kill something and um, that case drain line lets that go back safely to our, our case. So, Plug that one in first, then our raised lower circuit um, will be in your number one valve. Typically, we're going to plumb our markers to our second valve um, for marker control. Then I like to run in our variable rate drive motors into number three, and we plumb those all in um, with the, uh, if we come down here, the frame and the markers, we put the pressure, uh, the extend on the pressure side and the retract on the return side. Um, BRD, we'll do that a little bit different. We'll put that on the 
um, retract on the pressure side and same way with the vacuums on four and five, we'll put the retract on the pressure side as well. Um, the reason being is these motors, um, our SCV paddles in the cab, our switches in the cab, if we plumb them essentially to the uh, retract side, so forward is the button press forward, then we have the ability to push it on forward to float, to, to disengage them and turn them off. So that's why we, they're kind of, they're flip flop there. And then um, the extend port or the, your power port will go over here um, to, to the return. So your pressure to the return um, side of the SCV. Um, in the cab, on the cabin control side of things, when we're running VRDs and we're running vacuums um, through our touch set systems, or if, if it's through your screen on your hydraulic controls, you wanna make sure those are get, getting set up to a constant flow, that C indicator in your cab. Um, and then usually uh, we'll have some recommended flow rates here to set up those flows at constant. So um, this is our, recommended hydraulic hookups. Um, OEMs are really good to have these set in there as well if you have questions. So with that, I'm going to page forward through our guide to um, page 10. So this, we're gonna talk about other things we do outside. So we get everything hooked up, we pull it out of the shed, we're unfolding everything in the yard. Um, we might be visually inspecting our row units and our meters and working on things on the frame. Um, before we start dialing into all the things we have to do inside on the monitor, um, good, good time to, since you have it unfolded, to go ahead and make some measurements and hooked up to the tractor to make some measurements in order for um, documentation and recording to work well. So with that being said, we're just going to kind of dive in and talk from the tractor back to the planter, some necessary measurements that we need to, need to make. Um, on the planter side of things, the first measurement that we need to look at is where our GPS receiver is positioned on the machine. Um, there typically is a no, no offsets from lateral offsets with our receivers, they sit in the middle of the machine. So that should be a zero, but if for some reason it is offset, go ahead and make that measurement at, as the first one we're indicating here. Um, letter B, um, will be our next measurement. And uh, this is how the receiver is positioned in the cab in line. And specifically, where does it sit from the non-steering axle? So when we configure our monitor, we're gonna tell it it's a row crop tractor, and then we're gonna make a measurement on a row crop tractor from the rear axle, your non-steering axle, to the receiver, as this picture indicates here. And then the last measurement we'll make is receiver height. Um, oh, excuse me. This is the uh, picture of a, a four-wheel drive tractor. So our non-steering axle on a four-wheel drive tractor is our front axle. And so we'll measure from the front axle to the receiver as indicated in this picture here. Kind of jumped ahead. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, no problem. In the, uh, in the last session, we had, uh, we had a question about track tractors um, on where you measure there. And Margo can show it in the monitor, but the monitor usually does a good job of showing where that point is as well, if you forget. Yeah. yeah. So track tractors, they don't really have a front or a, or a non-steering axle. They pivot in the middle. So I always basically take the center of the track frame and measure to the receiver on a track machine. So that's kind of the rule of thumb on those. Next, we kind of pick up where we left off, right? We made a measurement from the receiver to the non-steering axle. Now we're going to look at that measurement from the non-steering axle to our connection point. Um, in this picture, we are looking at a two-point connected planter, so like a 1770. And um, so that would be a measurement to this pivot pin here inside the 2630, where we're going to measure to. So axle to here. Um, number one is a rear pivot drawbar. So if you hook up to your uh, drawbar, like with a DB planter, that's the measurement you're gonna make in that scenario. And if your planter is mounted, uh, this one in the middle, number option number two here, this measurement from the non-steering axle to your two-point connection, or your, excuse me, your three-point connection for a mounted planter 
would be the measuring you make there. Of course, on a four-wheel drive, the non-steering axle where we left off on those was up front. So we'll make a measurement from that front axle back to your draw bar. Usually if you've got a big tractor like this, your draw bar using a draw bar connection on a bigger frame planter, larger planter. <clears throat> and then lastly, we point out uh, there is a measurement of for the receiver height. So center of the GPS receiver to the ground. I don't have a picture here of that, but pretty self-explanatory and the monitor does walk you through it. So while you got your tape measure out, once again, we left off at our connection point. We need to make some planter measurements here. So connection point to um, your first point of ground contact. And then from there, we go to our seed drop point. So there's both an A and a B measurement um, in our 2630 screens that we need to fill out. Quite honestly, you can measure from point A to basically, if you've got a row cleaner, or a coulter up front there, you can make that measurement and then you leave off there and measure from here to our seed drop point um, on the planner. So seed tube is what we're looking for on B. Um, the next thing that we look at, we have D kind of pointed out here as well. D is the connection point to, to the rotation point of the planner. So that's your, that's your axles, that's your planner frame wheels in that scenario. And then lastly, um, if there's any lateral offset with your planner, so if it for some reason does not track straight behind the tractor side to side this way, you would have to put it, enter that in as well. That typically is always going to be a value of zero in our, in our systems. So these are great reference documents. They're online. They're in our guides. You can pick up at the store, um, kind of helps keep all those measurements straight and they are critical this is if these are not accurate your section control will not be accurate either yep. this is a, probably the most common thing where somebody says everything worked great last year thinks nothing's changed and then they don't verify these and don't dig seed and then corn comes out of the ground and it, you have these perfectly rectangular shaped skips or overlaps at the end of the field so it, it does pay to verify and like Margo likes, write, write down those measurements in, in that guide. Yeah, write, the, write them down in the guide if, and keep it in the tractor cab. You know, things happen and uh, what was once saved is not saved. So we, it's always nice to have that. So I have jumped out of the guide now and I have moved over to our simulator. And this is uh, a John Deere simulator that I'm using and we've got it configured as a 2630 monitor with a Seed Star 2 XP planter. Um, so that's so we're kind of looking at a sample homepage here. And now that we've moved into the cab and we fired things up, um, probably one of the first things I would do is go ahead and calibrate my um, terrain compensation module on my receiver. Um, so main menu, and you might even do this prior to hooking up your planner too. It's easier to do this calibration with something without something behind you. But main menu, and we'll navigate to our Starfire 6000 or 3000 receiver. And uh, you'll get all the information on this uh, receiver here under the info tab. So I guess I would point out, make sure that you're getting uh, 3D either SF1 or SF3 signal. Uh, if you're not getting that, um, you might need a software update and uh, potentially a problem with the receiver. Um, so that kind of just lets you know that that's all working. Next setup tab, want to make sure that um, the TCM is on. And then down here in the lower right hand button is our cal button. So we'll navigate into that calibration. So anytime we are starting out the season and moving a receiver, so if you take it off your tractor and then move it to your combine and then back, we always want to do a fresh calibration and it will store the calibration date in here. So you'll kind of know too, if it's been done on this machine or not. And it does give it an error code until you do it. So um, calibration of TCMs, pretty simple and straightforward. We're also, once again, referencing that um, non-steering axle and they want us to flat uh, park on a flat surface. 
and reference where that non-steering axle is. So either mark it on the ground outside or have a reference point that you're lining up with. And we'll start the cowl basically facing one direction and then referencing where that axle was sitting, we're gonna turn around and face the opposite direction. So if I was facing north in my yard, turn that vehicle around, face south, essentially putting my axle in the exact same position as it was before, and then hit that cow button facing the other direction. And what we're doing here is the train co compensation module is what compensates for cab roll four aft side to side. And uh, we're just getting a good calibration in, he in here to understand how your machine sits, how level it sits. So, and to get that zeroed out um, for how it sits on the machine. Um, that might be affected by the configuration of the machine, tire sizes, air pressures, those sort of things. Yep. And probably the most common thing you see with this not being set up right is you start seeing skips and overlaps in the field um, or just poor auto track performance, right? That's absolutely right. Whenever we get a comment regarding um, wide, narrow guess row, so pass to pass accuracy is poor um, and or just essing things of that nature, we, we come back right to this calibration. We make you redo it. Yep. And it's a good practice even at the beginning of the season because like you said, tire inflation, I've had it before. Hey, nothing's changed. It's the same tractor, same planter. Well, you got new shoes on the tractor, got new tires and that's yeah. changed. So, yep. Okay. So from there we can navigate away from our Starfire receiver by hitting our menu button. Um, our 2630 menu, um, we're going to navigate next into the GS3 portion. So the GS3 menu is where we do all of our setup for um, your mapping, your auto track, your section control, all, all those AMS applications that we do. Um, so one nice feature when you come in here um, and you hit, it defaults to this GS3 button, this GS3 button has a setup menu or a setup, I kind of call it a how-to wizard um, to walk you through all the other buttons that we need to be configuring. So if you go ahead and know that you need to be, you want a map, right? So it tells you right here that we have to visit the resource, the machine button, the equipment button, and the um, documentation button to order to map. I want to also auto track when I plant. So we check that box and I'd like to use my section control. So that automatically defaults in, um, everything we need to need to, need to walk through and set up. Um, if you're using implement guidance, you might want to hit that as well. So I'll hit the accept button, but this is what most people are going to be uh, configuring or need to configure. So when I hit the accept button, it basically walks me through nine pages of setup. I'm on page one of nine. Okay. So I'll go ahead and the first button that we're going to walk through here is the resources button. And um, under resources is where we do select our client farm and field and set up our task. And notice they're all have red asterisks. They are absolutely required in order to make a map. And our end goal is to make a map. We wanna know what varieties we plant where. So um, when we come back to harvest later in the year, um, we can track that performance and that progress, right? So deer is my client. I can go ahead and select farm. Today, I've got a farm called simulator loaded in and then a field called the South 40. So I'll go ahead and select that. Little tip or trick, as you're getting ready in your yard, I would say um, have a farm and field or a client farm and field labeled test, test, test. We use that a lot when we're setting up in our shops. And uh, that way, if you do raise lower the planner, maybe move forward and you know just test out your mapping. Um, it doesn't necessarily put any data inside a real farm and field that you're gonna use this year. Um, make sure we hit our task in here for planting. And then also, um, choose your crop year. Also really important, this crop season is accurate. Um, when you go to unload your data in the operation center, it will go to the wrong, it gets, it'll get stored in the wrong bucket, the wrong year if we don't yep. have that accurate. And one um, other uh, one other comment, we, we're not gonna cover this during this uh, session, but setting up all your, your fields and, and uh, boundaries and products in operation center prior to this step so that you have all of these 
pre-populated. And if uh, we're not going to cover that in this, this uh, session, but um, we have a few different videos about that um, that are on Facebook and on YouTube that you can see. Yeah. I'll kind of, I will show you this quick. Um, I just flipped back to my um, guide here. But once you get all those done in the app center, right, and you create that setup file and you've saved it to your USB, it's as simple as inserting that USB into the 2630 monitor and it should pop up if you've saved everything accurately, right, you've done it right on the computer side of things, it should pop up a screen and ask you whether you want to import or export your data. In this example, you're going to import, right, because we're trying to get that setup file in here. And then um, you have to name that profile in Op Center when you're creating your setup file. Um, you would go ahead and um, select the one that you created for spring planting of 21 and then hit this begin transfer button. So that's what that would look like. Um, 2630s are also capable of wireless data transfer. So if you did send it wirelessly, a lot of us are updating our machines with new 4G JD Link controllers, um, and you're going to send that information wirelessly. You would have to navigate to um, that same GS3 button we were in and go to the memory tab, and it should be waiting here as a file to apply. So you select it, and then it'll ask you if you would like to apply the setup. And then you can go ahead and apply that setup and that will import that information in. So we have that captured pretty well in our guides. Um, it's easiest to show you there. Flip back to my simulator, make sure it's all laid out the way I want for you. There we go. Um, so that's how you get the information here, right? To choose. So all that work we do preseason, get that imported in, then we can choose it here. So Client farm field is accurate. And then of course I've got a task and a crop season. We'll move to page two. Now it's moved me down to the equipment button and I'm under the machine tab specifically here. And uh, we're going to lay out machine information. So this is where all those measurements we wrote down outside will come into play. So go pick my accurate machine profile here. I might have an 8,030 tractor. And once I get those connected, also no, note how we're hooking up to my planter. So I'm going to hook up with a rear pivot two point because I got a 1770 planter. And then I'll hit this change offsets button. Okay, so it knows on 8030 that this is a my non steering axle is a rear axle, but make sure double check that make sure it's accurate if you're using any sort of third party tractor um, or a little bit. Um, uh, older tractor, you might have to tell it that it's the rear axle here, not the front. And then um, those measurements we were making, of course. So A, no lateral offset, that's a letter uh, zero. This is that measurement, letter B, from our axle to our receiver, our non-steering axle to our receiver. Um, letter C is from our non-steering axle um, back to our pivot on that, on that uh, 1770 planner as indicated by the drawing here. And then D, well, that was our receiver height that we would wanna punch in here. Also kind of important just to double check by default, when we plug in a seat star controller um, and a planter is on our CAN bus, this recording source should be uh, grayed out and should be auto. So if you have a seat star planter, this should be uh, reading auto. Um, if you are not using a seed star planner, you might have to choose your recording source here. Um, it might be a height switch uh, situation in that in that scenario where you'd want to choose that height switch. Um, so I think that pretty much covers uh, the equipment side of things. We're going to page forward then. We've got that complete. And it'll bring us to the implement side of things for measurements. Once again, it with a seed star planner, it's going to know it's a planner. And it's going to populate um, the planter serial number off of the controller, typically. And um, I would always use this one in that scenario and use your use this one to store these offsets in here. Then it stays with the planter. And if you would move it around to a different tractor, those measurements would be stored on the planter. Um, we'll hit change offsets and get those measurements loaded in that we took earlier. Remember the critical ones, um, letter A and letter B. 
Those are re responsible for documentation and section control. It, in red, it does designate the addition of A and B is where section control will engage and mapping will engage or disengage. So we measured from the connection point to the front of our row unit and then from the front of our row unit to the seats tube was the measurement we put in B. Letter C typically is zero because there's no offsets in our planners, they track right behind us. Letter D is that inline, inline distance from our connection point to our frame wheels. Make sure that measurement's down when the planter is down. And then letter E is if you have any sort of um, second implement, you make a measurement there. Yeah, and something here to, to watch out for too, Margo, is they change this sometimes depending on the screen or whatever uh, version of display you're in, but um, paying attention to those uh, numbers. So this is in tenths of feet or tenths of inches. It's not you know, 10 feet, 6 inches. It's 10.5 feet. So I know some people have gotten tripped up on that by that in the past. That's right. And uh, all your measurements here are entered in feet. If you noticed when we were doing our measurements for the machine, those are typically entered in inches. So um, what here's what you'll notice if you get something really out of whack, typically when you come back to your home screen and it kind of paints the icon of your tractor and your planter, it'll look off if you, you usually can catch it um, at that point. It'll be way behind you or way in front, way close if it's not accurate. Also on this screen, um, just uh, want to verify that our our widths are accurate. So it's pulling this information from the planner. It's a 24 row 30 planner. Um, looks like our track spacing hasn't been uh, fixed or updated yet. So I might hit that and have that match. My simulator might not quite agree with me here. I have a little bit of a sticky button. Oh, that's great. But you want your Wow. You want your track spacing to uh, typically match your implement width um, when we are setting up our widths for the planter for both documentation and then for auto track. Yeah, these simulators are close. They're, there's a few things that are goofy. And these simulators simulators are available for anybody to use. If you go to myjohnier.com, just if you're going to use it as practice, be aware that stuff like Margo just ran into there can happen. There are some small glitches. So we'll work through them and just, yeah, make sure um, you should not run into these kind of problems on your monitor. Um, so next is um, I paged up to the page four of our nine section setup here. And now we've navigated into the section control soft key. And it's important that we have our section control master checked on. We only have one operation today, just the planting seeding operation that we're going to control with section, section control. But if you did have, say, a rate controller and section valves on your rate on your planner for fertilizer, that would be something else we can control with section control. And it would just show up as a second operation here for application, um, product application. And uh, once we get into here, we have a feature that most of us probably aren't using um, in the row crop side of things, but there is a head, headland control option. So if you weren't using, um, if you weren't planting your headlands first and creating coverage on your headlands first, you could utilize headland control if you have a, bound, a good boundary. And that would basically, uh, you tell it then where your headland is and it would shut you on and off based on that. In general, we don't use this much here. It's an air seeder thing. Hey, and Margo, then, can, I, uh, can I pause yeah. you for one second? We have a yeah. question in the feed. Um, so it's kind of backing up to the um, where your work point is on the planner. So if you've got sure. a split row planner um, with two ranks, where would you measure for the seed drop? Awesome. Well, and I think it might help. So we'll just kind of talk through it. But um, so when if you're dealing with a, we have a, like a split row planner that does this. So when you put them both down for soybeans, um, also, you'll see this on our 1770s, even if, because of the narrow transport design, I want to say the, the center rows, the six rows that are in the middle, yep. or the four rows that are in the middle, they actually sit a little bit further back than the, um, the row units on the wings. Um, but in that scenario, I typically, especially with dual ranks, I will measure to the, I, I basically cut it down the middle, right? So if it's, uh. 20 feet to my front rank and it's 22 feet to my back rank. 
to my back seat tubes, I'll call it 21. Um, and that's when it truly is a double rank and I have equal number of row units, you know, in either scenario, right? Um, in that narrow transport situation where, you know, we're all, it really is just one row. There's just a few rows that are off. Then I usually enter the measurement for the, uh, you know, there's more rows on the wings than there is in the middle. So I, us I usually use that number or I measure to those. I hope that clarifies it. Does that make sense, Chris? Or yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, that's how I would do it. Okay, so I left off. Oh, I jumped ahead. We were in section control here, and um, I think I was ready to talk about overlap settings. So inside the section control button, or yeah, section control setup, you have the opportunity to go ahead and kind of customize how you want the planter to overlap or skip when using section control. So typically with the planting operation, we like to, um, so there's three areas here. I guess I'll slow down a bit here. You have, you can set up how you want it to uh, treat boundaries and how it, whether that be an exterior or an interior boundary. If you're not using a boundary, not gonna really matter. But typically um, we wanna make sure you can either do a minimize skip setting, a minimize overlap setting. So it, the difference here in all three sections um, would be the whole section. So if two rows make up a section, if you're gonna minimize your skip, both of them have to get through before it shuts off. If you're going to minimize minimize your overlap, the very first part of that section, when it hits the boundary, it's going to shut it off. That's the difference. And then, of course, with coverage or any of these, you can also do a percent overlap, so kind of customize it. So if you want to split that down the middle and do 50%, once again, my, my simulator and my keypads are not working well today, but if you wanted to dial that back to 50%, um, then it would, yeah, as half that section gets through, then it would you know, engage the system to start or stop planting at that point. If this confuses you at all, um, or you need a refresher in the cab, um, these question marks, these help menus that are inside um, the section control app um, are really good at explaining it. So instead of opening up that operator's manual that we all, you know, stuff under the seat or behind the seat, we can, we have some on-screen help here as well. So we'll hit the um, accept here. And then the next setting inside section control is on and off times. And uh, once again, this will this help menu is really good at explaining that. Just to give you a little bit of a ballpark here, typically our turn on times are gonna be anywhere from like a half second or 0.3 to maybe a full second. Those are some default settings for corn planters. And then our off is usually that 0.3 to 5.5 seconds um, as well. So if you've got, so let's kind of talk through, if you did, if you did all this last year and those numbers are kind of in the ballpark, I wouldn't touch them, especially if it was tuned in pretty good last year. If they're all over the place, maybe we want to get back to those default numbers. Um, this is actually what we're going to tune when we get in the field, right? When we get in the field and we are going to, um, dial in that planter, maybe tie up a row unit and uh, go in and out of the headlands and dig and check for where the seed is placed. This is where we're going to um, make those adjustments. And to be clear, when we turn on, um, that is when we are leaving previous coverage. And when we turn off, that is uh, when we're going into the headland, entering that previous coverage. So just make sure we're making the adjustments in the right box. And uh, a thing that we see commonly is people don't take the time to make sure the measurements are right, and then they try to cheat it here, right, Margo? That's yeah. right. That's right. We uh, so back to I, I kind of gave you some default numbers there, and they're pretty low numbers. If you've got two, three, four seconds, you know, in here for a planter, okay, we're not talking sprayers, planter, even on a sprayer, I think there's just not that much delay. So if you're having to use big numbers to overcome a skip or an overlap. We usually tell you, let's go back and get our tape measure out and just double check that we had this. Did we push something in the wrong box? Um, make sure we have an accurate measurement because this really is delay. The delay of the VRD system kicking in 
and that seed, you know, that meter turning and that seed rolling down the tube. Okay. So um, it's not a huge delay, a little bit bigger on the on side than the off side typically. And then lastly, um, if you wanted to, depending on what you want to see for uh, map settings here, you could tweak that as well for uh, the coverage maps. And then we'll hit the, the next page. We finished, went through everything here. Now we've moved into the documentation side of things. Um, this is where we designate what crop we are planting. So I'll go ahead and choose corn, nothing too extravagant today. And uh, back to my, I like to use test when I'm in the yard. But this is also, you notice how this is all, uh, I got little red asterisks in here. Um, absolutely required to make a map. So if we kind of skip over this stuff or um, don't think it's important, need to make sure um, we're getting this done because this will not make it, or it will not record if we don't have a good variety in here. So by default, when I load the variety in, it assigns it to all the rows. But if later, if I wanted to, um, you know, split my planner apart and only have this on half of it, I sure could. And then you could assign another variety to the other side of the planner if you wanted to. Um, yeah, good for test plots. If you're going to do yep. a split planner, or, you know, do three, four varieties per planner. Yep. Absolutely. Now, uh, for those of us using prescriptions, another thing to take a look at is if you have, if you have uploaded, you know, you've gotten those prescriptions either sent wirelessly through uh, your JD link connection or with a USB, um, and you've already imported those into your monitor at this time, you could go ahead and hit your RX button and that would open up a menu to go find the corresponding prescription for the field you're in. So it would have to find a, you know, if I've got a, if I'm in the South 40, I have to go find my script that was written for the South 40. And you could apply that right here under the documentation tab. So now we're moving over to the guidance tab because we're getting kind of towards the end, right? We're getting all of our setup done. Now we're going to talk about um, what kind of tracking mode we're going to use. So um, straight track for going back and forth. A lot of you guys um, are, you know, you might not be using your markers on the headlands or you've created some adaptive curves um, or AB curves for your headlands. So you might pick that out first um, if that's what you're going to use there. And so I'm going to just probably use AB curves. Um, so I'll, I'll explain why you would choose one or the ov uh, over the other pretty quick here. So um, AB curves and adaptive curves are nicer headlands because they, tip they typically aren't perfectly straight. So you're not going to, you don't necessarily want to snap a straight line between an A point and a B point. That's why we would use an AB curve. But when you do an AB curve, it will, every time you come back to use it, it's always going to repeat that original pass. So if you wiggled three times around, I don't know, um, a pole or a fence post or a rock pile, that's going to be repeated every pass that you use this AB curve. So some customers um, are, uh, like to use AB curves and they'll use an individual track for east, north, um, west, and south side of the fields. Um, adaptive curves gets used if you just want to kind of track around the whole field. And when we do an adaptive curve, it's constantly recording where you've been. And um, it basically repeats your last pass. So if you make any sort of adjustment, when you go to you know, resume that adaptive curve um, on the second pass or the third pass, however many, um, any, if you did any grabbing a hold of the steering wheel and you want to smooth something out, so maybe you're, you're going around a rock pile and you want to smooth that out uh, the next time, you sure can. And it would repeat the, the last pass. That's the main, main difference between an adaptive a, a B curve versus an adaptive curve. Um, so we have some basic settings under here too that we could look, take a look at. Um, you know, if you don't, if you want to see, um, you know, which direction you're heading. Um, if you don't want to see a message if it deactivates. If you don't want to hear the beeping if you're off the line at all. All those are all kind of little settings that we can tweak right here, um, as well as uh, light bar settings 
And then once again, this is where we dive in and find, we probably aren't going to use these settings for curve track or auto track quite yet. Um, you'll use them when you're tuning in your system in the field. Um, I usually recommend having some shifts on just in case you need them. If you're, especially if you're not using RTK and there's a potential for drift throughout the day, we can do that. And then um, if you're using boundaries, this would be our option to choose the boundary or create a boundary um, in the field. So if you're gonna create a boundary in the field, typically you do that on your headland pass and you would start the um, recording as you start your, your first trip around the field. There, you can pause your recording when you kind of start, you stop, lift up the planner and turn and back back into that corner and then resume that recording and that will kind of pick up where you left off. Um, and then when you're all done, it's important to stop that recording so it saves. And it should paint it over here in pink um, for the field and you'll know kind of if it's accurate or not by looking at that illustration. I could explain boundary offsets too. So when you are recording a boundary in the field, um, so in this example, 60 planner, you probably want your boundary offset to be 30, maybe 30, 31, depending on how close you want to get to the um, edge of the field there. But it's uh, how far we're how far we're going to be offset from the receiver's offset from the actual boundary. And then lastly, it's setting up that AB line. Um, I, of course, I was I chose AB curve mode. So set AB curve. And then we would, if you had a current line, so a saved one for previous years, you'd pick that. If it was new, you'd go ahead and give her a name. And I would probably call it better than just number one. Uh, give it a good name. It's the east side. So you know which one it is later. Because these all unload into your operation center and you want to make sense of everything, whether it's a good line or not good line. And then of course, um, with AB curves, we're going to um, set your A point and then, or start your recording, excuse me, and then you end it later. So that kind of, that completes our setup. Um, so I'll hit enter here. Now we get a little disclaimer. I mean, you've gone through everything that we think, but if you skip something and you didn't fill it out, it may not record. So go ahead and hit accept. Um, and then we can come back to our home page here to get ready to go. So pause that. Um, so it's kind of funny for me because I don't get to pause and ask questions and see how well I did. Um, Chris, any questions come through the feed yet or? Uh, no, no more new okay. questions here. I guess I'm maybe one um, quick refresher on uh, layout manager. Or you're setting up your home pages. Okay, we could talk about that quickly. So um, let's hit our menu. So to lay out a home page. So I've laid out a page and I've got basically a coverage map up here, um, a half page planner monitor here. And then um, I've got uh, client farm field selection tracking set up over here. Um, if you want to change that or lay it out any different or add more home pages, you certainly can by hitting the menu, going inside the layout manager. Um, you have the functionality of having five pages that you can um, save, configure and save. And then if you're going to use them for um, your collection or your home button, you have to have the box checked. So if I wanted to add a new one, I could come in here, hit page three, choose how I want to lay it out. Do I want to do three sections? Do I want to just do um, two? Maybe I want to have a full planter screen in here and then a little mapping screen over here. I sure can. So click on that um, planter, put a full planter in here. And then over here on the right hand side, I can go ahead and choose green star. And then I got all kinds of options, but maybe just want to kind of keep it simple, have a little mapping screen that I can see over here, auto track information, auto track status, section control on off. It's good to have a on off here. Let me say, okay. It's good to have this button um, on your homepage configuration for section control. Um, Cause if you're in a pinch and you're, um, 
maybe you stopped in the middle of the field, I don't, you big rock. Okay. So we're moving it or it's, you had a row acting up, right? Um, if you stop in the middle of the field and now we probably want to raise the planter back up and just make sure we didn't don't have any gaps or skips, right? Or we weren't real confident that the planter was planting. We want to make sure we don't leave a gap, right? So turn off your texture control because more than likely it did have some coverage. So this way it'll ignore the coverage. It will plant because you put the planter down. And then of course you can recheck that box. So section control will engage and work when you get to the headlands a little later um, for a normal, normal operation. So with that, I think I'll navigate um, over to the planter side of things. So we've been, sp we spent our time with the receiver. We spent our time with the green star system, getting all that configured to get ready to go. And now we'll move over to configuring your planter and getting your planter ready to go. So this is the seed star two planter menu. Um, depending on whether you have the XP option or not, um, you'll see extra these extra buttons down here. So we've got this configured to be an XP planner. So additional monitoring for not just population. We have um, singulation, spacing monitoring, downforce monitoring, and ride quality monitoring with an XP planter. Um, so these were available um, from about model year 11 through current. I mean, we have used this similar. This is also still available today from our factory with Seedstar 2 XP. Um, so planner at a glance at the top. And then if you want to move into other monitors, we hit these buttons down below. But let's focus on setup first. So we're looking at our run page. We have two setup menus that we can dive into. The first one we'll dive into is just setting up our crop. So we'll come and hit the little seed in the arrow indicator here on letter H and make sure we have the correct crop loaded in for our planter. Um, we're probably gonna install ProMax 40 seed disks. So we're gonna wanna make sure we have corn selected for our disk type. And then um, we're not gonna be using a standard disk, that's a pre-cell disk. And we wanna move to our ProMax 40 and choose that. Um, we also have the ability to uh, set up our rates here. So we'll hit show rates and uh, our Seedstar monitor will store uh, six rates, basically five kind of custom presets. And then uh, the sixth rate is, does, is uh, set aside for prescriptions. Um, I'll hit change rates. And uh, one and two already had something populated, but if I wanted to put a third one in, I could choose rate three and go ahead and dial in a target there. Maybe I wanted something low. And as once again, got a little sticky keypad there. And then really critical over here. So it defaults to off. We need to turn it on if we want it to be available on our home screen to choose from. So I turned that one on and then I would hit uh, save. Well, this is kind of a nice little feature too. Um, whatever rate you do punch in, it will calculate average spacing for you in the in real life it's not on the simulator um so you see the addition of rate three available for us to pick from and then rate six here probably if you're going to use scripts like i said make sure this gets turned on for us and if you have loaded a rx in this will read rx over here and that's kind of an indicator uh, you got to have these both on for them to work um, if you have loaded your RX in on the documentation screen, like we saw earlier, but you didn't turn it on over here, you can choose it there. It will not work on the planner. That'll be, that's kind of a common phone call we get. We didn't turn it on over here. So that's uh, pr pretty much setting up your crop type, uh, seed disc type, and uh, getting your rates loaded in there. Um, we leave this box typically checked. So, um, however, if with a prescription, if you wanted to uncheck this use rate for all motors, you sure could. And, you know, if you have three VRD motors on your planner and part of your planner is in one zone and part of your planner is in another, if it's kind of cut with the um, VRD, you could do that. Or if you were going to do a trial and split your planner and wanted to set a rate up for one side versus the other, it would do that too. If So typically we usually leave this checked, but there are some options. There's always options. So I'm gonna move back to the other setup button now. So we talked about crop setup. 
now I'm going to talk about um, some just good things to double check before we get going in the season um, in the yard. So we got the planner unfolded and uh, we're punching configuration into our monitor. This setup button kind of goes, has three tabs, frame, sensor, drives. I'm going to draw your attention to um, the sensor tab because that's where the most activity was going to be here. This is just coming from your seed star monitor as far as the frame configuration. We'll move over to sensors. Um, the first sensor in the list is seed sensors. You just want to make sure all rows are turned on, make sure nothing is turned off last year or ignored. And then um, this headband warning suppression, we get some feedback that we like to have this one on. Um, what it does is when section control is operating on the end rows, um, and when you raise your planner, it pops up a message that says you're not planting. If you don't want to see that every time, it does obstruct your view, um, your turning view on your screen. So that's why we like to suppress that. Um, so we sometimes we come in here and turn that on. And then uh, we got our vacuum sensors. Uh, just make sure that they are accurately zeroed if you need to. I would probably next would go to the, our height sensor. So this is a great time to make sure that's calibrated accurately. So we're unfolded uh, in the yard. We'll have you raise the planter all the way up, hit enter, and then lower it all the way down, hit enter. So we just basically calibrated the top and the bottom end of that potentiometer type sensor on your planter. Um, if for some reason it doesn't calibrate, well, indicator that like, we might have a bad connection, um, wiring issue bad sensor, those sort of things. And then also we could use this button here to set your, these, this kind of indicates your drive motors uh, start and stop. So we've selected common. So we can just, when you choose common, um, after you get your high and your, your up and your down calibrated, I usually have you go ahead and lower your planter down to where it just, the opener blades are just brushing the soil surface or your, and, uh, then we hit this button to calibrate when the meters will start and stop. So just gives us a little time to, as you're lowering your planner, if you think about turning around, lowering your planner on the end, it'll engage that drive at that point when it's just starting to graze, hit the ground um, and get the system all engaged and ready to go. And it won't actually um, turn on until your session control allows though. So. Um, next, I'll move to tractor speed. So this is just a good place to make sure we have our tractor speed uh, accurate selected. I would recommend auto. When you choose auto, it's gonna look for either GPS speed from your um, receiver or for radar speed, if you've got a radar installed on your tractor. Um, if you're having trouble and it's not, you know, if you put your, you know, you get all this set up and we decide to put the planter down and you know, put a little seed in and drive it forward. And if it's not recording and we think it's speed related, there is a connector inside the cab that we might need to, uh, switch around if that's not working. Um, next, I'll move to downforce. Uh, with Seedstar XP, you have downforce monitoring. There's load sensors, not necessarily on every row, but you might have five sensors on a 24 row planner. Uh, downforce, if we calibrate these, it will also kind of tell us that that system is going to work for us. So the process is for downforce is if you raise the planter all the way up, those sensors are on the gauge wheel stops. So with the planter all the way up, there's no pressure on those stops, right? The, the, the gauge wheels are just hanging there. Um, so with it all the way up, we should be reading zeros down here, no load. But if we have any stray load or pounds in here on the sensors, we'll just hit the zero button and that zeroes it all out. Um, this is a simulator, these dashes, would it be probably not, you should have a reading here. It should be zero. And then when you put it down in the ground, based on how much downforce you have in your system, there's also a reading in pounds that you'll see here. Um, but it should read zero. If it doesn't, you'll get a code or an indicator that maybe we need to get out and look at that system. So that pretty much, uh, there's a couple other sensors in here that I'm not gonna go into detail. There's a spot to zero your air pressure. So if you are working on your air system for active pneumatic, we might have to zero that out. Um, as well. So just uh, more configuration there. But that, I think that's where we'll kind of, those are the common ones, the things we usually hit preseason to get a good feel in the yard that we're doing the right things. So with that, um, 
I think we'll kind of migrate over to the run page now. And I'll just give you kind of an overview of some of the things that we look at in the cab when we're planting. So um, if we're going to get ready to plant, um, this is our run page. Over here is our target. So remember those rates we were setting up? If I wanted to use this rate, rate two. Um, that's how I changed my target rate. Um, or this is how I choose my prescription as my target at rate six. Um, and this will be my actual. So how's my planter actually doing? And this, this is a simulator, but this is your planter at a glance. This would be your target population of 32,300. And then how it's doing, uh, you know, um, this is a simulator um, in real life. Once you set your planter down and you get cruising across the field, um, you might have a little bit of this on that initial planter drop, but they should be pretty darn close to the line. Yeah, we'd be getting lots of phone calls with this picture here. Yeah, this is not this is not a pretty this wouldn't be I wouldn't be happy with this for population, right? It wouldn't be we should be very much dialed in. Um so things to you know adjust if your population is off. So a couple things. Population also correlates with singulation. So that's your second button here. So um this might help us help us understand if we have uh, doubles, you know, so you're, if your population is off, right, you got bars above the line, you're throwing doubles. If your population is low, singulation is low on a row, you have a, a problem with skips. So we talk about getting ready with the planner. We want to make sure we're using accurate vacuum um, for your seed size. Okay. Those, that information is in our guide. It's also, um, in uh, your operator's manual, okay? The larger the seed, uh, seeds per pound that your pack, your unit is, uh, the more vacuum you're gonna run. So out of Promax 40, you're gonna run probably somewhere between 12 and 18 uh, inches of water, somewhere around there with corn um, uh, for that. Now, the other side of that is your double eliminator setting inside your meter. So, um, you know, while you're getting ready here before planting, just make sure that that double eliminator um, is set typically we set that in the middle option just the middle of the road that will cover there's three on like xp row units on fives there's like 10 settings so uh you put it on number five on a max merge five row unit on an xp you put it in the middle and uh that will accommodate you for 90 percent of your seat sizes so um you know, and then of course, just regular meter maintenance. So we're still ahead of season here. Take a look at that um, meter when you install it, give it a good spin, you know, lock that seed disc in, give it a good spin, get a feel for that hub tension. It feels a little loose. Make sure we're pulling that pin and turning it clockwise to tighten that hub tension up if that's the case. Um, make sure you get them all latched. You know, sometimes we get to the field and we got one that's not latched. Uh, maybe we get to the field and we don't get a cover tight and vacuum's not good or we didn't reconnect a seed delivery hose. We didn't reconnect a vacuum hose on our CCS systems. All those sort of things are things that can affect um, singulation and population when it comes down to it. You know, that's a meter problem typically, right? We're not getting seed two of the meter. We're not getting vacuum to the meter, or we need to make adjustment in the meter if we have issues in this part of the this part of the planter. And that would kind of correlate to with. Uh, spacing that's your spacing the next button over is your spacing monitor this is um a little bit different so we don't have a center line we have a bottom line and we're look we want short bars when we look at uh spacing because this is a basically the variation the coefficient variation of spacing so if we're planting a population that should give us perfect six inch spacing this is kind of indicating which rows are giving us a little bit more or you know more deviation than that perfect picket fence spacing. Our planners, um, typically this is, um, represents zero, right? We're perfect up here would represent, I think, um, I think a half 0.05 coefficient variation. If you come down here and look at the, we're at 0.23, I want to say the recommendation is 0.3 or less. So it, essentially all the university studies that we look at when it comes to spacing at about 0.3 coefficient variation, that's when it starts impacting yield. So um, if you got more inaccuracy here than we like, um, you know, things to think about, seedbed prep, 
downforce. Maybe we can stabilize the row a little bit better. Maybe we're just driving too fast. You're trying to stay in front of, you know, stay in front of some rain or something like that. But that would be kind of what's going on there. Yeah. So Margo, this, if we have any uh, students watching, um, this is a perfect reason to pay attention in statistics class. Cause <laughs> I had to relearn all of this. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. So little bars, I guess at the end of the day for all of us, uh, common sense, right? We don't want to know all the math behind it, short bars. And if we keep that in that, but honestly, uh, a, a well prepped seed bed and, um, you know, a well set up planner, we see, I mean, normal numbers, 0.15 to 0.25, you know, seem to be what we see there. Um, so next, um, I'm going to move over to this downforce screen. So we get a lot of questions about downforce. Um, how much should I use? And uh, how do I set this margin number up? So um, when you were working with Caesar XP, remember we have five sensors across our planter. Um, and those sensors are on those gauge wheel stops. And when we put that planter down, depending on how much, uh, how many pounds of, you know, downforce we have in those airbags, that, and how much resistance it's feeling against the ground, that, that load cell is kind of just giving us a arbitrary number of how much margin it sees. So how much load is on that row unit. Okay. And uh, we basically establish um, a margin setting and we need to do a field check and we need to verify how that seed um, looks in the seed trench. Um, are we applying enough down pressure in our system to keep our sidewells firm, not let them collapse and then all that seed is dropping straight in the bottom of that seed trench. You know, that's, that's our goal, right? We need very consistent depth and placement in the seed trench. Um, the right amount of downforce will let us do that. Um, if, we, if we don't have enough, we'll have trouble there. Now, you also can run too much downforce, and then we start looking to make sure that we're not um, overcompacted. I like to pop my pocket knife into the sidewall of any seed trench and just make sure that it kind of ribbons out kind of easy. If it comes out in big, thick, long clods or, you know, um, takes a lot of force for me to you know, peel it away, we're going to have a hard time closing that, right? And then root development later will be a difficult, will be difficulty, you know, um, you know, growing through that potential compaction we're creating. And it also creates more wear and tear than we really need on um, gauge wheel bearing, um, gauge wheel arm bearings, those sort of things. So how do I set it up? Um, right now I'm in set point mode. So when I look at this target number, this is actually target pounds. So if I used to have springs and I'm used to springs and I always put it on the first notch, start with 125 pounds. That'll get your airbags aired up and go plan a little while and uh, see how it does. Take a look at uh, what kind of margin those sensors are seeing on average. And then uh, if it sees, um, 85 pounds of margin on average, and we do a field check and everything looks good. Turn her on over to the active PDF. And now we're talking target margin and we can punch in our 85 over here, which I think deer over the years, it was around 85 was a default. I think it's kind of grown to, once again, a little trouble with my keypad. It's grown to um, a recommendation of about a hundred pounds of margin. And that's a pretty conventional till type situation. Um, we'll uh, get it done. So, and just understand too, that the system is active, but it, you know, it's adjusting the, it's looking at the load on all these sensors. It's averaging that margin. And based on what you put in for a target, it's going to use more down pressure. So if you decide that 125 pounds of margin does a good job for us, um, you know, in certain parts of your field, it might only take 75 pounds of actual downforce. In other parts of your field, maybe on your headlands or where you had a lot of traffic in and out, this might be 175, 175 pounds of downforce. And that's what you're seeing over here, the actual pounds of downforce. So it's a real eye opener with these systems to kind of understand what's 
what's going on underneath the soil as far as uh, compaction and traffic and those sort of things. Um, I will move over to the ride quality button here. This is just, uh, I, I think it's a, a good reminder to understand if we are um, A, using enough downforce and how well is that row unit uh, fall, you know, moving across the field, right? If we've got a lot, so a um, little bit different here, you want a full line for wide, wide quality. Um, that means it's at 100%. So when they start getting short, that means your row unit's bouncing a lot. So on, in this scenario, you want a full line um, closer to 100%, the better, the better ride quality, um, um, the less bounce you're going to have with that seed transitioning down that seed tube. This button, you can hone in on a certain row and just watch one row if you got a problem row. That's your row details button. And then this is a nice kind of, it's busy, don't get me wrong, but it's the whole planner. It's kind of your min-max screen, right? So it'll show you your min-max rows that, um, you know, for high or low population. And then um, kind of just a summary of what you're running for downforce, spacing, you know, averaged across the planter. Um, you can customize these buttons in the middle. I like to set one of them up. Um, so these are acre counters right now. It might be a limitation. Usually you can set these up for your vacuum pressure too. So that's nice to see here. If you've got vacuum sensors, you can see those, those on here as well. You got a totals button over here. Oh, rotating your meters, talking about getting ready, going to the field. Um, you've got your CCS fans on, you've, uh, Put your planter down you've primed and you got seed all down to your mini hoppers um once you get everything primed there um, and you got your pressure adjusted outside of the cab by your tanks um for your ccs fans this is now you're going to get back in the cab right raise your planter and uh this will let you rotate your meters and when you rotate your meter um couple, two, three presses, you know, you want to see C drop out of the tube. Now, you know, you're primed um, actually in the meter as well, right? we got to get seed from the CCS tanks down to the mini hopper. And then we got to prime our meter. Now you're ready to get started. You're going to get your planner all maneuvered into the corner and back down and you make sure everything's all ready to go. If you sit there for longer. So when you lower your planner, uh, quick start is automatically enabled. Okay, so it's going to energize everything at the with the variable rate drive system at that point. And uh, if you sit there longer than six seconds, this quick start reset button up here will kind of restart that counter so you can kind of take off. So um, that's just to help minimize, once again, another error here with the uh, simulator. But uh, quick start is there to minimize our uh, skip from a dead stop. Um, so variable rate drives, they are hydraulic, so it takes a little bit for them to ramp up. And uh, we energize that system and it's ready to go and minimize that skip. Well, I know we're kind of pushing up against time here, Chris. Anything else that I'm missing um, or you would like to add? Any questions? Yeah, I think you did a great job of reviewing uh, in, in the yard setup um, with the 2630 and Seedstar XP. Um, just a few reminders. You know, if you want to go back and view the uh, getting started with the gen 4 monitor we did that a few weeks ago and that's available on youtube and facebook uh, this will also be uploaded to youtube as well um, tomorrow at one o'clock we're gonna switch gears a little bit and focus more on what to do when you actually hit the field so we've been uh, doing a lot about you know initial hookups and now we're going to talk about things to to hit when you go to the field a um, couple other just friendly reminders uh, i'm going to go back to our website here um, some promotions we have going on. If you go to our main website and on our banner, uh, we have a new tool called Kibble Access, which if you sign up for a free account, uh, this is a way for you to log into your account and be able to order parts uh, online, see inventory online, and also reference um, some past invoices. So you can download all your uh, invoices from parts and service as we get ready for tax time here. And as a promotion uh, to incent people to sign up, if you sign up in the month of March, 
you'll be entered to win a John Deere gun safe, which is a very nice prize. Uh, and then as always, um, if you have a 3000 or 6000 receiver, it does require a mandatory software update to work this year. Uh, that's something you can do yourself on StellarSupport.com or you can bring it to one of our stores and we'll do it for a small fee. Um, along with Starfires, um, this is about the time of year when we start thinking about those SF2 and SF3 subscriptions. Uh, so we will we'll be reaching out to you to do that if you don't contact us uh, before we do that. And then lastly, Margo, um, she talked about that wireless data transfer on the 2630. Um, 3G terminals, which uh, were in machines for a few years, aren't going to stop working this year uh, because AT&T and Verizon are, are shutting off uh, 3G service at the end of this calendar year. Um, so we do have this promotion where we can upgrade your 2 or 3G uh, MTG to the latest and greatest for a pretty good price. So you can take advantage of wireless data transfer, uh, remote monitoring of your machine, and uh, remote display access. So did I miss anything, Margo? No, I think we've got it. Got all the uh, announcements out of the way. Don't forget to get your receivers reprogrammed. Yep. We've already, we're starting to get lots of phone calls that say this, they aren't working and, uh, and we need to get those updates done. So appreciate everybody's time. Uh, feel free to comment in here if there's any other topics you'd like to see us cover. And with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, and be safe. Thank you.